Hi, everybody. So um, I'm Tanya Berger-Wolf. I'm a professor of computer science at University of Illinois at Chicago. I'm also co-founder and director of the Wild Book Project at the Tech for Conservation nonprofit WildMe. And uh, today I'll tell you a little bit about this and how we got there. So uh, International Unit of Conserva for Conservation of Nature, UCN Red List, uh, which is today, as many of you know, probably the uh, the international authority on uh, uh, determining the con and tracking conservation status of uh, species around the globe. And right now they have about 90, uh, about 90,000 species that they, uh, that they're tracking in the red list. And the goal is 160,000 by 2020. But if you look at the species that they have right now, uh, about out of these 90, actually, can you see on the screen, do you see also the, the, the overlay of the zoom or is it? Yeah, we see your mouse moving. Okay, um, is the zoom overlay also there? <laughs> Just to make sure. Uh, no, no, we only see okay, your mouse. Great. Excellent. So uh, out of the 90,000 species today that they, that they have, uh, more than 15,000 are data deficient uh, which means it's not really 19,000. And if you look at more, in slightly more detail, then uh, uh, what it means that even iconic species like uh, orcas, killer whales, are data deficient. For about 13,000 others, such as savanna elephants, you know, African elephants that would, would today are the iconic conservation species, we actually don't have the numbers. We sort of have the trend for different uh, parts of the continent. Uh, for polar bears, it's vulnerable, but we don't know the population trend. And for species that we consider knowing the numbers, such as whale sharks, um, the uh, population size, effective population size, uh, was estimated um, most recently in 2009. And it was uh, estimated to be 100, about 103,000 with a standard error of 27, between 27,000 and 180,000. So that's a very scientific way of saying we actually have no clue. <laughs> so, you know, and we want to go from 90,000 to 160,000, almost doubling. But that means, like, what does it actually mean? Can we really scale up monitoring uh, populations around the globe and doing it repeatedly so we know the population trends and doing it completely and at high resolution you know do we can we really tell how fast the elephant population of africa decline or where how far the uh, whale pods go or how many bobcats are in the world or how many juvenile turtles survive to adulthood uh, you know the the great elephant census uh, which was funded by the paul allen foundation took two years and eight million dollars that's not scalable or repeatable. And, uh, you know, we can use colors, but uh, there are not enough colors. And even with an open source and cheaper solutions, there's still, uh, we cannot really color every elephant, every elephant and track them all over the globe. Besides, you know, some of them can be uh, dangerous to elephants themselves. So how do we really do non-invasive, repeated, scalable, um, cost-effective monitoring of species all over the globe. So our answer to this is images. To date, pictures are the most abundant, readily available source of information about everything from what you had for lunch to what animals you saw uh, in the wild. And these come today from scientists, field assistants, camera traps, um, and also tourists going on safaris and whale watching tours and posting their images on social media. And we can use them. The problem is if we can just uh, design the right uh, computational solutions to take advantage, to collect and process uh, and extract information out of all of these millions of images. So, it's not the, the, your image search algorithm on Google, you know, show me all the pictures of zebras. Because if we want to take 
images in the wild from amateur photographers or and camera traps and everything else, there's really a serious problem there. So uh, I don't know if you can tell how many zebras there are in the picture on the left. There is this serious overlap problem there. Uh, if the if you you know you can count quietly, uh, and then I, you know if you answered four, you were correct because here is the one in the front. If you count the legs, so one, two, three, four, then there is another one, one, two, three, four. There is an extra leg there, so that's one more zebra, and there is an extra head here, one more zebra. So uh, it's, a, it's a problem that you know, humans have trouble counting, so computers uh, have even more trouble. Uh, we have different viewpoints, uh, not only left, right, front, back, but also bottom and top if we're gonna count from uh, drones. There's quality and lighting and uh, <clears throat> uh, resolution. And of course, uh, scarring and aging. So here's a pair of a foal and a mother where the, uh, the of the same zebra and the mother is, uh, uh, sorry, and an adult, a foal and an adult, and the adult uh, is pregnant and we still have to be able to recognize. So how do we take all these millions of images and find uh, all the ones that we need? So in this case, I don't know if you can find quickly, right now, two seconds, all the elephants. So we've designed uh, algorithms that can take all these pictures and find uh, all the images that contain the animals, find where the animals are in those pictures. So not only here's an elephant there, but here's one elephant and behind it, there's the baby elephant. And all deal with all the overlap and different viewpoints and different environments. And we can tell you not only where the animals are, but also what species they are, the savanna elephant and humpback whale and hawksbill turtle and uh, gravy zebra in this case. We use, uh, if you're really interested, there's a series of, uh, uh, of deep learning, uh, five deep learning sort of stacked solutions that bring it all the way to saying out of all of these boxes that, of animals that we've identified, we can actually go further than just telling you the species. We can take those and tell you that not only this is gravy zebra, but this is zippy the zebra. So we can identify down to individual animal and Terry the turtle and, and, and uh, Willie the whale. And so again, this is a com completely different set of algorithms that we've developed and we can um, so we can match, not only we can match, we can also tell you exactly what the algorithm thinks, why the algorithm thinks it's the same animal and aid you in, in human verification to make sure that the uh, match is correct. We can do it for anything striped, spotted, wrinkled, notched, but in also recently developed algorithms that can use the shape of a whale's fluke or dorsal fin of a dolphin to identify that individual. And we're now pushing it to um, use for the elephant's ear. And now together with information on when and where the image was taken, we can really start using images to track uh, individual animals, comp population, comp population size, uh, birth, death, dynamic species range, and social, even social interaction. And so we built a platform called WildBook as in some kind of, uh, book for wild animals. So there, there are several instances of it. So here's an example of one for cetaceans. Uh, right now it's five species of whales and uh, two species of dolphins called Fluke Book. And Pinchy is a celebrity on that uh, platform for cetaceans, but we have it for many other species. In this case, it's social, so you can, this is how all of them look. So you have uh, the picture, some information about that, such as uh, who it is, um, some birth death, if we know it. It may show up in many different data, data sets, so it has alternate IDs. It's a, it's, it's a social animal, uh, so we have all the social interactions and a list of all its sightings. And uh, not only we can now collect it from photos that are direct, directly uploaded to the platform, but we can take pictures, scrape, we daily scrape pictures from uh, social media, such as YouTube videos. We have an intelligent agent that uh, in this case uh, looks for videos of whale sharks, finds the ones that have been posted, finds the frames in that video that uh, uh, contain a whale shark, identify, uses our algorithms to identify the individual, and then uh, uses natural language processing to um, understand the, to process the, the title of the video, 
to extract the information when and where the video was taken. So in this case, it says whale shark diving Cancun, July 2017. So we add that information to, in this case, Wild Book for Whale Sharks. And so here's that entry, July, Cancun, July 2017, Cancun, the contributor is YouTube. And uh, so all of uh, that, that's what a wild book for whale sharks looks very similar to the fluke book. Some basic information, pictures, the sightings, it's not a social animal. So, um, but when we, we can extract uh, some network information out of it and a map. In addition also, it has all the um, conservation organizations and research projects that have this particular individual in their data set because these are global species. So there's not one project, not one, not one uh, organization that have the entire view of even one individual. And so that facilitates collaborations among scientists who, and conservation organizations by seeing who else has that piece of data. And so we started pre-wild book with a few hundred, with a couple of hundred known individual whale sharks, and we've just crossed the 10,000 known individual marks using wild book. Uh, con that the information that comes from more than six, uh, close to 60,000 uh, sightings of the animals contributed by eight, close to 8,000 uh, citizen scientists uh, studied by 189 research and conservation projects and one intelligent agent. And in fact, over the year of its existence, this intelligent agent, YouTube intelligent agent brought in more data than all the human contributors combined. And 96% of this is unique data, not cited by other uh, human contributors. And we've now expanded it to uh, five other species. And so now the, the official information on IUCN Red List for whale sharks comes from wild book data. And the most comprehensive study on the biology of whale sharks was uh, co-authored by 36 authors that met through the pages of uh, Wild Book. And there are many actually studies that are now uh, using uh, Wild Book data. The first, here's a couple of other examples of the power of this technology. So the first deployment of uh, the first version of Wild Book was at Leyva Wildlife Conservancy for Gravy Zebras, uh, which is the headquarters of Gravy Zebra Conservation Trust. And uh, they started collecting that data. And in fact, uh, the, the, the sort of that enabled, the, they, they brought in the idea of using Wild Book uh, technology to the first, for the first ever full census of an entire species, that gravy zebra, done com entirely by uh, ordinary people driving around the country Kenya for two days because 95% of the gravy zebras are in Kenya. And so in 2016, in January, hundreds of people um, were driving for two days all over the country, taking pictures of gravy zebras from school kids and local tribe and, and, and uh, rangers to US ambassador to Kenya and tourists with telephoto cameras, 40,000 images. Later, we've identified all the zebras and uh, provided the most accurate count of the uh, species to date. Uh, so that's 2,300 plus minus about 90. Um, and uh, it was so good that Kenya Wildlife Service asked us to do it again. And in January 2018, we, uh, we, we supported the second Gra Gravis rally. And uh, uh, more than 1,000 people participated. And that time, they also added reticulated giraffe. This is my favorite one. It's uh, uh, we call it emoji giraffe because it has a heart and a smiley face. Um, and it's the first accurate count of the uh, giraffe. And in fact, it showed that the population is growing. We have super tight uh, bounds. Um, it also showed not only that overall population, but we're able to break it down by property. It showed that there are not enough juveniles in uh, one particular county in Meru. And that allowed the change, uh, sorry, the change of the um, uh, population management uh, for lions to put the predator and prey in balance because that's the reason there are not enough juveniles. And uh, now there are uh, many offsprings. And in fact, um, that data provided the, uh, the, 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 the basis for the Kenya Wildlife Service and the government species conservation management plan 
Um, the governor is more to make the stable population an increasing one. Cabinet secretary accepts the numbers and Kenya Wildlife Service allowed for the first time line contraception, as I said, to put the, 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 the predator and play and prey in balance. And now IUCN uses uh, these numbers as the official species uh, numbers for gravy zebras. So there are a couple of issues and that shows the very different kind of collaboration, sort of the breadth of collaboration that can be not only uh, scientists, but also, um, you know, the entire, the citizens of an, the entire country can collaborate and be participants in the policy, the uh, conservation policy. Um, there are a couple of issues that I also want to raise that if we're using social media and uh, sort of this massive ad hoc crowdsourcing as the source of information about animals, there are lots of biases that are coming in um, and, uh, you know, we, if we want accurate uh, population estimates, then uh, we need to radically change our statistical models. And part of my research as a data scientist, sort of putting on my researcher hat, is we're now really uh, building very different kinds of machine learning models for, for, for estimating population size from social media uh, data. We're also working very hard, very, very aware that uh, what's gold for scientists and researchers is also useful for, um, for poachers as data. So our wild book data is protected. And in fact, we're, um, we're collaborating with researchers, specifically Ross Anderson, who is a security and privacy policy uh, expert at Cambridge University to design policy for security and privacy of uh, endangered species data, particularly geotagged image-based data. So he gave a keynote, invited keynote at the most recent top security conference, computer security conference, USINEX. And so now we have more than uh, wild books for more than 25 species and growing, uh, ranging from uh, whale sharks and manta rays and cetaceans to uh, project which projects with WWF International uh, uh, Internet of Turtles, my favorite IoT, as well as giraffes and uh, lynx and seals. And it shows really the power of machine learning and data science to scale conservation and science and public engagement and really sort of help uh, fulfill that goal of uh, studying and tracking animal populations at large scale and high resolution over space and time. And there is a large number of people and organizations and volunteers that are contributing to this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, well, you've, uh, you've sparked a lot of conversation in um, the chat and some, some um, specific questions. Um, uh, Katie, do you wanna jump in first and um, um, uh, put your question to, to Tanya? Hi. Hi. Uh, let me see. I think I had two questions. So, um, uh, gosh, Stephanie, if you can remember which ones I'm looking in our. Uh, so, <laughs> what, what I can answer maybe. Do, do you so want I to? Think, yeah. I think you were asking about um, where data is, uh, where you're sourcing images from. And I, I'm not sure you covered that. Um, Oh um, yeah, I was I, I was yeah. curious, like uh, yeah, around sourcing and if contributors such as nature photographers wanted to engage with the platform proactively. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah so maybe I'll stop enough. sharing this one and share a slightly different uh, part of my screen um, to show you a little bit what it looks like. So here's uh, an example uh, of Wild Book. Oops. <laughs> there we go. Uh, here's an example of a uh, wild book, and I hope you can actually share, uh, see that. I think you've stopped. Uh, oh, okay. there we go. There we go. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, and we just got the honorable mention in the uh, Facebook's uh, World Changing Ideas Award. But here's an example of wild book. So people can actually upload, uh, report directly their sighting uh, to uh, our wild book, in this case, wild book for whale sharks. You can upload your footage and videos and images uh, one at a time. We'll extract the information that we can or 
uh, scientists can upload in bulk. Um, we, we're working, so we're a flagship partner of Microsoft AI for Earth Initiative, and part of, the thing, part of this engagement, a year-long project uh, that, that we have, is to have a, by the end, we're hoping that by the end of uh, May, hopefully, maybe a couple of months off, uh, we're going to essentially have one wild book to rule them all, so you don't have to figure out where to go for, for, for each one of your pictures, but sort of dump the entirety of your images to, to wild book portal, we'll sort, we figure out which ones are uh, the species that we can currently identify, you'll also be able to spin a new wild book at the click of a button and a little bit of an investment, uh, hope on Azure, so we're, we're running on Azure right now and uh, uh, different people, you know, collaborating, maybe pulling together for different species uh, to start a new wild book if it doesn't exist or contribute to an existing wild book. So right now, as I said, scientists feel this is anybody can upload either in bulk or individually. Uh, there's a, the different levels of access that people will get depending on who they are. And then also we scrape uh, YouTube for different species. So including for humpback whales and uh, um, turtles. So here's and lynx and giraffes. Katie, I think you had a second question about um, uh, a different application and it kind of echoes um, Shashank's the question Shashank just posted, which was, um, uh, Katie, you were asking about whether this wild book could be applied to online um, sales and tracking um, online trade of illegal species. And Shashank was also wondering, can wild book be used to identify wildlife from top down aerial imagery? So we're working on a slightly different technology and we actually working with Vulcan on uh, I think of tracking animals from uh, from high above, where you really can't make out individual species. So drones we definitely can use, and we've tested um, airplane sort of fly, uh, images of zebras that we can identify. But for much uh, for elephants, for example, it's hard because the features that we use to identify individuals um, stop being distinguishable once you have low resolution of, of uh, airplanes, but we certainly can count and we're you now developing, um, pushing that technology to, to count from uh, aerial images uh, for, which spe for whatever species that we can. Now, the about sort of illegal wildlife trade and poaching, um, we, so we are, working on some of the uh, some of the projects that where we can identify individual animal and sort of provide forensic evidence that this indeed was an illegal trade. Uh, to give you an example, we had a sort of test project, uh, proof of concept with uh, star tortoises that are uh, these beautiful tortoises in uh, Africa few of them are left and uh, they are indeed uh, traded illegally. Each one cost, can cost about uh, 10 to 20,000 on, uh, on the black market because people use it to produce artifacts. And so there, the, the so old artifacts, antique ones are grandfathered in and they're legal, but new uh, ones are not. And so by using photographs and, and their conservancies that have used sniffer dogs to photograph all living tortoises, and then we can use that as a basis to match any sale of an artifact to verify that it is not indeed one of the living ones, that it wasn't one of the currently uh, taken from current existing ones. Um, I think, oh. Uh, oh my goodness, there's so many questions. Okay, um, hmm. Uh, I just want to make a couple of points uh, sort of before I forget. So about open source, so we are open source. Um, we're under very aggressively, very aggressive open source. We're, we're under GPL3, so nobody can use our code as part of a commercial uh, application. 
uh, we also have APIs, open APIs, because open source doesn't mean that everybody can use it. In fact, it's very hard to take code, which is just code, and sort of create an application out of it or modify it. Somebody has to maintain it and it has to be well engineered. Part of our goal is with the Microsoft uh, engagement is also to produce well engineered code. And we also have all the APIs so people can interact with our code base and contribute to it. Um, can I, can yeah. I interrupt? Pascal, do you want to jump in? Yes. I think I successfully unmuted. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, thanks for a great talk anyway, but um, the, does open source actually include the, the models themselves as in the uh, coefficients, the pre-trained models that we could actually deploy? Um, not at the moment. And that's because we're still figuring out how to, what is the right way to do it? Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, species detection and then that pipeline, so it, it, we find that we need to do iterative training still. Yes, uh, you certainly would. <laughs> huh? You certainly would, yes. Right, so we still need to do iterative training. So we are, we, we're a little bit worried that if we like deliver the models too early, it's going to produce crappy data. Yes, I can, I can uh, understand that. On the other hand, of course, um, if you put those models into the hands of more people, you might actually get different developments starting from those, well, starting points, yes. right? So the uh, models themselves, the, the, not the coefficients yet, but it, so the models themselves are going to be part of, and it's part of the agreement with Microsoft AI for Earth, is that they're going to be part of the Azure API, so people will be able to use them directly. And even for the species where we sort of, where they have stabilized to have the pre-trained models and uh, or use the APIs to train their own models for um, for different species and for different data. But that just acts as via API, right? That's That means you can only use them on Azure. Yeah, so as I said, okay. we, we, we're certainly, the reason we're not we're not deploying it is because one they have to be well engineered and deployed through the, you know in a way where people can actually take them and use them. Uh, right now, it's a messy developer code, um, just as the rest of the we we're re-engineering the entire world. But uh, our goal is to have a well <laughs> to have to open them. So it's not the lack of will; it's the lack of uh, right now time and 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 just five engineers working full time. To, 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 to produce a product that, that, that people don't come back to us and they, this is, this is like really bad. Yeah, I, th I think uh, they are valid concerns. Um, pretty much every project uh, that isn't, well, a, a perfect company-driven product starts out pretty much exactly the same way and faces the same issues with uh, open sourcing. Unfortunately, um, experience shows that quite often people don't actually get to that intended stage of being able to having cleaned the code up to a point where they finally feel comfortable sharing because often well as you and i know well, funding for scientific endeavors is typically pretty short term and often well you run out before it's finally done so that there's a certain um, while i can understand and relate to why you well go the way you do um, I think there's some merit in even, well, biting the bullet and going, well, it's, it's still messy, but then again, we tack on a label saying it's messy, be careful, it's on a development branch, but if you're interested, here, here it is anyway. Well, we have that. We have the, the as I said, we are GPL3 and it's, we have a GitHub repository for both the, the old version of Wildbook uh, data part as well as all the image processing. And part of the Microsoft, the, our contract with Microsoft that is re-engineered code will then be, become again, op we will have a, um, a, the new version of our code, which is open sourced. Uh, the models themselves, as I said, we, we're hoping that once we have a reasonably stable process that, that 
that we know that this what constitutes a bookmark in the training process, we uh, will open source it as well. That sounds great. I'm going to jump in here and open it up to the, um, the full speakers, because I think this is tapping into a, a larger question about um, uh, how to collaborate and how to, how to get, build a community around projects and get people involved. Uh, I think, Al, I think you might have, given that you're participating in the chat, I think you might have some opinions about this. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was, I was just uh, chatting because the, the questions were coming in at the same time discussing this. And um, yeah, it's a really interesting uh, conversation because it's touching upon the, I feel the need to support the core engineering team. So as you were saying with Wildbook, was that there's four or five of you. And Not very many people, is it, for how much you guys are doing? It's Crazy. Often the ways, right? And, um, I'm not one of the engineers. We have an amazing engineering team. I'm the project lead and the sort of co-founder and director. Uh, but uh, it, is, it, it is incredible and it's also hard work and uh, sort of that balance of supporting that comes through in all the projects of supporting the, the engineering versus uh, the, the, the community, the conservation community is a very delicate. Yeah, and uh, I think something that, uh, that was touched on in the comments too was success is actually difficult to manage. So if you if you think that your product is going to be successful, which we all want, so and, you know when you put in your your blood and sweat to to deliver solutions and services, success is a great thing, but it can also tip the balance in that you then from a small team can't actually sustain that success because you can't manage the comments and the support and keep mm -hmm. versioning safe and make sure that the quality of delivery is sustained. So I think a really good um, future discussion point and a tip for all of us is to look at how we can get better at doing that. And it may be that we have to diversify what a community is. So if you imagine uh, splitting out your support team and your core engineers and making sure that they don't, they don't cross into a realm where your engineers are, are basically on email and your fundraising isn't really associated with engineering, if, if you understand what I mean there. That's hard to do because small teams often have to do everything that a small company has to, has to contend with. Um, so the answer to that, there is no real distinct answer. The answer will come from the community in that the projects which do become successful, especially over the next few years, that are trying new models, I think will share back those wins and we'll probably see quite a shift towards um, a new way of thinking that does involve the community not just a small funded foundation that's on its own until that funding expires and then you, you basically don't have anything to, to fall back on and, and that's essential you to do. need the core team like to to almost um look after it and and um shepherd it forward otherwise i i don't see it working without having someone who basically owns it even if even if it is open well, I mean, the, the open source community, right, is, is not, is mature by now, and... Uh, I would argue that the open source conservation community is not. Really. Is not, right, exactly. Yeah. So the, yeah. op the more general open source software community is pretty mature, and they, you know, it means very specific thing to be a part of the open source community. It doesn't mean your code is open. It means that you're actually part an open source project means that there's somebody maintaining it, somebody versioning it, somebody testing every new, uh, every new modification to the code base to, to accept it to the code base. So open source project, for example, they will not accept everybody that just says, oh, here's our code. And, 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 and you know, this is a model that clearly, that's why, I mean, Pascal, I'm not saying that we don't want to open source. It just means that we want to be an open source project that means engineering and providing support for uh, people sort of developing parts of it further. And I think in conservation community, we, we don't yet have the capacity very well, but we need to think very explicitly how we're going to do this. Rob, do you, can I, Rob, do you want to jump in here? Because I don't, under, what do you mean by uh, a NASA model? Yeah, so, um, Great talks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much. I just, I worry, I've mentioned this a few times on Wild Labs, that as you were talking, Tanya, there was maybe 
three or four other people who listed that they were essentially doing exactly the same project that you were doing in a different sense. Um, and what concerns me is like, if you think about, you know, GPS tags or camera traps or anything like that, we're all in these little bubbles, you know, thinking that we're developing this great new thing that's going to be useful for everybody. And then we just end up, you know, effectively putting it on the shelf because either somebody does it better or we run out of funding or we run out of steam or one of our engineers has a fit and decides to leave the, the process or whatever. So I, I'd i like, I guess, I don't have a solution, but I, I would like us to be able to talk about finding ways where we're not constantly reinventing the wheel. And the NASA model, I think, is that kind of a seed of an idea where they kind of um, seek input from a very wide group of people about where projects should be directed and what funds should be directed at. Should they go to, you know, IO or uh, Enceladus? Should they go to Mars? And as conservationists, I think we could do something very similar. Like what are the priorities for us as a community of 3000 people? Yeah. And then a core group of people can sort of go, okay, well, lots of people are interested in this and this and this. And so this is where we're going to put a lot of our effort. And it just coordinates, I guess, the effort of three, 3000 people. Yeah. I think it's, you, you got it right with the coordinate. But if you can coordinate the community in a way whereby replication is minimized because you can go to a central place and see what's out there, that, that gets you to that next step up, up, up the level because I've been doing this for a long time now and you're totally right, Rob. Replication is difficult and it's, it's often, it often comes down to that we have to be better at sharing mutual success because everybody wants their name associated with something and a lot of politics get thrown in too, whereby someone takes someone else's open source um, um, core model or base, re-spins out something else and then never mentions or feeds back that it was uh, associated to, to them. And in academia, that always happens and it can be a real, real difficult mess to, to solve. But if we can get better at doing that and saying, I use this component from this uh, project and we turned it into this and here's everyone together moving forward, and we do that well, and we get better at, at doing that, I think we can start to become this kind of NASA model whereby you know where to go to get to the next step, and you can still be a part of it. Everyone can put in their specialist skill, whatever it may be, because everybody wants to, to contribute. And uh, I think it's that challenge too that we have to overcome. Can I call on Joe um, to, to add in here? Because you're coming from a... a... So Joe, Joe Nash is um, part of the Wild Labs team. He joined us from GitHub and has, a, has opinions here. <laughs> you want to share them? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think it's a, a great point and definitely a very doable one. And I think um, there is a lot of large uh, cross-project open source organizations that uh, the Wild Labs, you as the Wild Labs community can definitely emulate. Um, the point I just made to Stephanie that uh, she called me upon here is we actually have a resource that we've only recently started to really use for you folks, which would be um, the Wild Labs GitHub organization. So um, if any, I'm sure most of you work or have interacted with GitHub, um, one of the problems that uh, organizations uh, with organizations and kind of working on them is um, there's like a limited number of members you can have and so it limits your ability to kind of offer this centralized place. Uh, the Wild Labs one um, being part of a nonprofit is actually uh, unlimited so we can do some we can probably use that as a tool to for example track projects and provide that centralized infrastructure. Um, if that would be something that sounds like it would be useful that would be a uh, something I'd be interested in investigating if um, other people think that like having uh, project management and code tracking artifacts in that in a centralized location uh, like that would be useful. I think this is a thread that we can pick up um, in our next virtual meetup. Just we'll drop a link into the discussion that we're having on Wild Labs about GitHub and getting people to start we're starting the ball rolling with getting people to share what where they're doing stuff on GitHub, what they're doing and Guy, I know you posted just before we, we came online here. Um, and I think the next virtual meetup we're organizing is 
specifically about collaboration for this very reason. And where we've got someone speaking from GitHub, we've got um, uh, some people who are um, creating in-person spaces for collaboration. And what we've, we'd really like to delve into this question of how do you collaborate? What tools do you use? Does it have to happen in person? How can it happen effectively and bridge the gap between online and offline? And I think it will be a really nice continuation of this discussion in the context of open source and how as a community, all of us together um, in the Wild Labs community can do this a bit more effectively. Thank you, Talia, uh, has dropped, dropped the, the, the link. Um, um, Joe, you wanted to say something else? Yeah, um, I just wanted to like, we, a, minute, a minute ago people were talking about basically the, uh, the burden of open sourcing stuff and there was particularly a comment um, from Pascal just now about that, uh, isn't that what the typical GitHub model is about? No projects forced to accept any particular contribution. Um, yes, in general. So like the way contributions work in uh, version control environments is you make your changes on like a, your own version of the project and then push them back. Um, but it's, it, maintaining the project and like dealing with those contributions as a massive overhead to maintainers and there was a point that someone raised a minute ago which was like uh, maybe the conservation community uh conservation community isn't that like the numbers to deal with that yet but actually this is a problem that maintainers of open source projects everywhere are currently in a bit of a crisis about there's a bit of a maintainership crisis where uh, contributors are burning out left right and center because the how easy it is for people to engage with open source projects now basically like the minute your project goes public and people start to get, as, as uh, Alice has said, and it gets popular, the amount of uh, issues and pull requests and things you need to deal with really multiplies. Um, I'd highly recommend reading the blog of Mike McQuaid. Mike McQuaid is uh, a prolific open source maintainer who maintains Homebrew, which is the package manager for uh, Apple MacBooks. Um, he is He writes a lot on the problems that maintainers have with kind of like entitled participants in their communities and in particular how to say no kindly and how to protect yourself as a maintainer from uh the burdens of maintainership um i'll drop a link in the chat i'll go find it um but it's it's a, a problem that lots of maintainers face and it's definitely one to anticipate um if you do anything in the open yeah yeah and in fact uh you know, then then uh, there's the, the, the other side of the problem is even assuming that that you have this wonderful maintaining some some organization, let's say wildlife uh, wild labs takes on maintenance or some some community of open source for us. For example, what happens when there is a when there are, there, there are bugs that are discovered a priori that let's say allowed uh, access to locations of uh, tigers all over India. Who yeah. takes ownership? That's a really good point. And that's why you have to still have that core engineering team to maintain due to quality assurance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind, of, that kind of loops all the way back to the really early conversation today about what a platform is as well, in terms of a platform should be that space which does have Q&A as a part of it. So you can assure people that safety and security is, uh, is attained. And without that, if it's just left as a GitHub repository, what can sometimes happen too in that space, it can be seen with uh, CDNs, for example, where someone changes or puts a malicious file into one very well used um, um, library on the internet, and then all manner of hell breaks out because no one was looking at that. Yeah. In conservation, we can get better at doing that, I feel, in kind of how you're doing it, by saying there will be a core team. It's... It's that trick, as, as Rachel was saying in comment then too, as to how do you sustain that core team when we take out grant funding, which is really the de facto in our space at the minute. Uh, and we have to get better at doing that because it does involve money and it does involve time. And there are some services spinning up now where you can contribute to pay open source contributors and it becomes their job to just maintain projects. Mm -hmm. um, it may be going back to, to where corporates do get more involved in maintaining services that they inherently want to support. Um, but it's a, there's a big conversation in there around um, what is next. But I do feel there, there is a shift in terms of um, uh, it is happening in new ways, but it's very early days still. David, I was wondering, I, assuming you're still on the line, um, I was wondering how do you, how do you manage this, this challenge of... of um, I don't know if you answered it in, in your talk about how, um, I know you said that parts of the Trident were open. How do you manage your community and how did you mobilize um, 
people to to input into your program into your projects and how do you maintain that sustainably uh well we ended up hiring a lot of the the biggest contributors because we were growing so fast and we needed people to work on things um so that's how we did it we just hired our best contributors and um you know people who were contributing kind of tangentially we just uh, or a little bit, we would make sure that we donated tools to them. Um, so they, you know, they, there was some benefit, but you know, it never got big enough that it was unwieldy or it got it never got big enough that we couldn't find some solution or just talk to the person and, and do that. But I, but I think, um, you know, the, the, the hardware aspect inherently, because you're dealing with physical things, there are costs. And it, it makes a lot of sense to kind of run a business um, where you're selling things for more than it costs you to make them to, in order to keep things going. So I think that's why the, the tension between open and closed kind of rears its head more often in the, in the hardware space um, because it's, it's just a little bit more complicated. But um, yeah, so and does that answer the question? I think so. I, we had a question come in from, uh, or well, it was kind of more of a, a comment from Harold saying that um, the title of the meetups was low cost open source solutions. And while the endpoint might be low cost, it doesn't seem like the, um, the actually it's a kind of a mis misnomer to, to assume it's low cost because there is the overhead of, of needing to support that core team. Um, it is. And, and, I just want to point out that open source doesn't mean free. For, for many, it, it, is, it becomes uh, synonymous, but it's not. Uh, and and uh, we, we decided to go, for example, our model is open source protected data, open collaboration. But yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, we have to protect data because we have data on endangered species. We have data yeah. where, where we're mandated by the uh, by our customers so in case of NOAA, for example, the, the flute book, they, uh, part of the contract is that we implement a data sharing agreement among those who are registered as researchers and contributors, but protect data from uh, uh, people who would use data nefariously in various nefarious ways or or even just take somebody else's data and publish on it. You know, that's that's every researcher's nightmare. Yeah. So so implementing this data sharing agreement, we protect our we protect data, and we have pretty um, sophisticated ways of going forward, even more sophisticated ways. But uh, our model is software as a service because we found out that most conservation organizations are not able to take even well engineered code base and compile a wild book from scratch. They you know. They need help. And you know, our goal is to get to the point where the click of a button on Azure, if you're willing to do this, you know, to go that route, it's, it's, you can start a, 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 your own wild book, or we will support you in, uh, in, in starting your wild book. We'll go through, through your data, clean it up, make sure the models are trained properly and start instantiate. Uh, wild book. We have contracts right now for existing wild books where people still pay us to 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 take their data and make sure that it fits well and 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 integrated. So I think it is a possible route for open source to still um, be the, for the engineers to be supported. But we need to make sure that that is built into the um, the, the the culture of conservation and into the funders. Who are giving the money to conservation organizations to have the part that is, you know, that's paying for the way that it used to be paying uh, some number of thousands of dollars for uh, hardware and, uh, and and system administrator. You need to pay for uh, cloud services or for uh, some software uh, supports. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any sense, Alistair, if there's appetite for? The, uh, and if the from or, or actually any of the speakers or anyone in the chat really, um, if there's if that's shifting in terms of funders realizing and acknowledging uh, the 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 hidden the hidden costs. So I would say the funders are realizing the value that you can deliver, and that's the trick. You have to you have to switch it on your head and say, I will deliver 
a solution and a service, be it be open source software or hardware, to make this impact. And I've seen a lot of funding shift into that space versus saying, we are going to make 22,000 of these devices and they're going to cost X and we're going to sell them. And we're going to make this much profit and we're going to reinvest into the company. Um, that's what I've seen. But um, if you spin it on its head, what's, what a few people just mentioned there too are, there are successful companies out there, say Adafruit and Sparkfun, who make very low cost open source um, devices at scale, at huge scale. They're, built, they're making like 5,000 in a run and they're putting the, bomb, the, the bill of materials in and making a little bit of money on that. That's, that's working for them as a big market out there for, for them as a, as a company in terms of the maker space and a lot of um, um, kind of DIY crafters will, will consume those. In conservation, it is quite a niche space. Um, there aren't as many of us. We have a huge like, uh, you know, gathering now on, on Wild Labs, but it is still niche. And if you look at the traditional models, often there's a huge scale up on the cost of a device to, to pay those core engineers and pay those um, and keep the company sustainable. If funders are now more interested, which I've seen in being more about what the value is you're going to deliver, then I think we have to get better at saying there are 200, 300 of us working on this together. And we are together all going to have this impact and we're in all of these places and this is the value we've got from it. And here's the actual research which has changed fundamentally a policy or helps protect a species. And if we can't do that, it just becomes difficult to actually say it's worth investing in us as an actual organization slash community. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that, that's, that's hard, right? It's hard to show categorically that you had sustained impact because it takes in conservation many, many, many years. So it's, it's not an easy win, but I've, I have seen a change in, uh, in that thinking. Yeah, we... I would add, this is, this is David, I, I would add to that, the, we've got this site Open Explorer that now we, we actually sold that to National Geographic last year, but mm -hmm. that's the reason we've been able to get funders interested to pre-buy our units, because if you go to that seed initiative page, you can see the hundreds that we've shipped out to people all over the world, and you can see it in action, and so I think one of the things that's important, and we found, is that, you know, just publishing papers every few years after the project is done, is not, not enough. enough like yeah, like showing your work is really powerful and that's what you know open explorer is one tool to do that um but you're you're able to kind of show that you're out in the field doing this stuff and that that really helps because the funders love stories you know like they love impact and they love numbers but more than anything else is they love a good story and so i think that's what we collectively have to do as a community is continue to tell this cohesive story that technology is enabling us to, to understand and protect our planet in a way that we haven't before. Provide a way for more people than ever to get involved with that process. It's a simple story and as long as we all kind of stick to that major theme, I think more funders are gonna get excited about funding individual projects. I, I think there are also a couple of um, value sort of cal calculations to make. Um, you know, in our domain of, uh, of identifying individual animals, there are, we can directly make the comparison of how many human person hours, right, human hours it takes to go through photographs, to identify individuals, to, uh, to load them into a database without technology versus what the cost of technology Mm -hmm. uh, and, and sort of, there is a direct comparison there, as well as the impact it says. So Kenya Wildlife Service uh, was opposed in 2016 of this using t this, this way of counting zebras, gravy zebras. After they saw the result, and after they saw that it, not only they have the number, but they have evidence and verifiable evidence uh, that they can go back to, and see you know how it changes by county by you know different uh, different locations and different dem demographics of species it was complete turnaround uh and now they're going to do this you know great gravis rally every two years so we're gearing up for 2020 uh, we're starting in july plan we're actually now starting planning for it um so and and when we delivered the results for 2018 kenya wildlife service warden said 
uh, uttered a sentence that to me, like that made me cry. He said, this shows the power of citizen science and, concert, and the machine learning for conservation. So that, you know, that, 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 there are three firsts there. One is, that's the first time that Kenya Wildlife Service accepted data collected by uncertified data collectors. They've never done this before. Our youngest photographer was three years old. That was the first time, so that engages the entire population. The, the tagline for the event is Kenyans powering conservation, and the goal is to make it so. So, so that the technology, the impact of the technology is not only, you know, how many dollars do we save conservation organizations, but how many people will engage in the process. We've had students from Kibera slums of Nairobi start a conservation club because they participated in, in, in this kind of event. So how do you measure that kind of impact? Right? They, and explicitly saying that they feel now ownership of the wildlife. They will say no to poachers. They, they're saying no, they, are, they want to protect their Kenyan wildlife because they've seen it now for the first time. They, they feel they've contributed to conservation. This is also the first time that Kenya Wildlife Service accepted results that were produced by an outside organization so that you know, enables collaboration and, and trust. And for the first time, they used the words machine learning in a sentence, which is you know, also not, not bad. But uh, you know, we, I think we have to tell the story not only the dollars and how much time or money we save the particular conservation organization, but all, but impact that is enabled beyond what was even possible before. I think there's also a space here for linking up all of that's happening, not just Wild Books doing this and Arabata is doing this and all of the individual efforts that are happening with open source, um, but piecing it together and, and figuring out and telling the story of how they're all feeding into each other and how this community and this ecosystem of conservation technology is moving things forward. And yeah. even if you look at where we were three years ago, like it's hugely different. Um, and there's so much excitement and energy and, and, and people wanting desperately to work together. Um, and I think from, that's, that's a big change from it being very um, siloed and um, competitive. And I think taking the time to, and this point was raised earlier, I think, and in a lot of the questions is, how do you find the time to write up your, your um, open source projects? Um, I know Nigel um, from RSPB mentioned that. And how do you find time to write up the stories about what you're doing? And, and speaking as someone who speaks to a lot of community members and, um, is quite far removed from impact, but I know the impact we're having creating this ecosystem. We find it so valuable when you tell us how it's helping you. And like, it always comes to back, back to me in random conversations. So I think it would be, it's a nice way to conclude this because I know we're over time, is that um, taking the time to feed back into the community, Wild Labs or wherever your community is, and tell us how it's helping will help us move things forward um, and taking the time to write up and, and involve other people is, is really, really worth it. And I think we need to find ways to, to help that happen a lot easier than it is right now. Um, that's my, my takeaway. Um, I know we're over time, but it's, does, I just want to give our speakers one last chance to, to have a final comment um, to wrap us, wrap us up. Um, Al, do you want to go first? I would love to. Can I, can I segue into an actual uh, comment that someone posted too to do the wrap? Of course you may. Go, go ahead. So, we um, staying online, so. Gert posted a, a wonderful way to finish in that he's just stated that he is, uh, he's modified uh, the audio moth, so acoustic devices, to work on bat tracking. And he's now able to make flight routes of bats visual. That's a perfect uh, <laughs> like comment for him to post because it shows that by us communicating what we're doing with open source tools in a way where we can say, I've now done this and you pass that on so someone else can inherit it. We can start to do, as you're saying, build this um, community where we understand what's available and what you can inherit and what isn't available to solve that problem of replication that, um, that Rob was saying before, which is, which is an issue. And we can then bring that into a space where we've got a real pool of success in the field, which is, way more impactful than just us all individually doing something, which links to the funders where we can say together, we're having this impact as a community, 
how can we now go forward? And that money can then hopefully sustain that in a different way. So I liked how that comment just came up at the, at the, you know, the perfect time. Um, and yeah, just, just to wrap it up, the, the opportunity to deliver low cost hardware is, is in the early days. In conservation tech, it is early days. Conservation tech has been expensive. It's why I moved into the open source space because I was inherently buying closed sourced um, expensive hardware to solve challenges in the field. And it didn't have to be that way. So I, I started to work on breaking down those barriers. Um, it is early days, but I do feel we are having impacts. It's definitely not a conversation today where it's like, oh, nothing's really changed. We've still got a lot, uh, you know, it's a, a big fight to fight. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of success and especially over the last two or three years. So it'd be really interesting to keep that momentum going. And that's my, uh, that's my closing remark. Thanks, Al. Uh, David, do you want to jump in? And uh, any concluding thoughts? Well, I would just say that we've got, I've got a bunch of Trident that I'm eager and excited to donate to conservation groups and to citizen scientists and to folks on this call who are doing interesting projects. So please go to openexplorer.com slash C-S-E-E and tell us what you're doing and um, we're shipping those out right now. So um, I'd love to love to see what you're up to and, and hopefully we can support, support your project. Thanks. Awesome. And Tanya? Yes, uh, I love that we're talking about collaboration and sort of what it means to open source. I think this is the community to define how we're going to collaborate around producing technology. So first of all, thank you uh, for starting Wild Labs because um, this clearly, you know, even this conversation shows just how much it's needed and how people are coming together and discovering. And so hopefully something will grow, a model in this space will grow out of this. Uh, because to me, we can, I mean, there's no, right now we cannot compete. There are too many challenges and they're too urgent for us to, 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 to replicate the, you know, the wheel over and over again. And, and we're looking at it from very different perspectives and, and, and we have to put our heads together. So, so having this community, I think, and having these kinds of conversations is a start of figuring out how we do it in a way which actually benefits the, the, the conservation community best. And that's, that's our goal. Um, a smaller comment, uh, I'm seeing on the thread a lot of uh, the, uh, uh, the, this comment saying, we are doing species detection too in different contexts. We're happy to connect with all of you uh, because, and, and our species detection pipeline goes beyond species detection, it's published and it's open, it is open source and the code is available. So if you want to play with it, um, it somebody actually posted the paper uh, link on, and, and there's a GitHub as well, like I'm happy to, to connect. But uh, also that, that we go beyond that and, and again, we can put things together and make something even big, bigger out of each one of our individual projects, hopefully, um, with, with all our heads put together. So let's do it. What a great way to finish. Um, all I can say is thank you very much to our speakers and thank you to everyone who's joined and stayed longer. Um, Talia has just dropped in um, the link to where the notes and recording will be and I would encourage you all to, I think there's a lot of threads of discussion started in this one and in all of our virtual meetups that, um, that are, are common and that we can start moving towards answering and, and moving forward um, outside these meetups. Um, there is something powerful about having everyone in the room and, and being able to chat and talk, um, but I think we can start um, actioning some of the stuff that comes out of these. So. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks to Talia for all her hard work behind the scenes. Um, and we'll see you at our next meetup or on wildlabs.net. Thanks everyone. Thanks.